Hello and welcome everyone to the Emerging Tech series of the Leadership and Insurance Podcast. I'm your host, Gavin Savage, and this is the podcast where we speak to technology founders, executives and leaders from the world of insure tech. And today, I'm very lucky to be joined by the CTO and co-founder of Shepherds, Mo. Hello and welcome. How are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? Glad to, uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's always funny that because we, we speak before the camera and I say, how are you doing? And I have to ask you again, but it's just to make sure the audience need to know how you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my answer has not changed uh, since you know, before the camera <laughs> now. So I appreciate you asking again. No worries. No worries. Um, well, look, we, we've known each other for a little while. You know, I originally speak about the podcast. I'm excited to get into Shepherd and, and, you know, the space that you guys are operating in. But before we get into everything, I always love to start, you know, your background is, I would say, probably very traditional. You know, some people, for example, maybe start in other avenues and other industries, but you're very much technology from the beginning. Could you give us a... I guess a brief introduction to your career, how you've ended up in the world of sure tech, and um, that would be great. Yeah, actually, uh, fun fact: I, you know, I'm the CTO. I'm a, te- a technical co-founder. Was this, you know, my like what I do is software engineering, but I uh, did not start off that way. So I, I grew up in Canada, went to school in Canada, and right outside of Toronto, I studied psychology and economics. Um, so that's what I did in school. Um, I thought it was really interesting to combine, you know, the psychology and, and specifically my program of psychology, neuroscience and behavior. So everything to do with that, um, everything to do with like psychology research, um, you know, the null hypothesis was like the thing that I was, you know, studying and reading and learning about reading a lot of these research papers, etc. So that was that was a lot of fun. That's actually how I learned to code because I had to code an experiment that we ran first year students through. Um, so that was my first exposure um, and I decided, you know, I didn't want to learn too much psychology. So let me do a double major. And that's where economics came in. But um, after I graduated school, I moved out to San Francisco and I worked at very smaller startups um, as a software engineer. Um, prior to Shepard, I was at a small company called Airbnb. Um, and uh, I've been there for four years where I got to work on a lot of internal tooling, um, more specifically launched the Airbnb Lux product, which were just really nice luxury multi hundred or multi thousand dollar per night homes um, mm-hmm. and then transitioned over and built up the internal tool that powers all of airbnb's uh, emails push notifications sms etc this is a couple of years back so maybe things have changed since that you know the tools have reshaped um, but that was that was kind of how i you know what i did before shepherd but how i got into insurance is um i knew i wanted to start a company i didn't know when i didn't know with whom i didn't know what um but um, right around the turn of the pandemic is when Justin and I met uh, my co-founder and uh, he started his career working as a risk manager at big construction companies in New York City, identified a problem, had some insurance aspect to it, but um, it's to do with pre-qualifications. And so he um, started a company uh, and quickly sold it up to a company called Building Connected, which then sold up to Autodesk. Um, so him and I met, he was at you know big Autodesk, I was at Airbnb, um, felt like we had kind of mutual interests. I was interested in insurance. I thought it was a big industry. I was interested in construction, thought it was a big industry. Just found these like really um, underserved from a tech perspective industry is really interesting. So um, we brainstormed a bunch of different ideas. Some of them didn't work out. And when we got into Y Combinator is when we decided to focus on this. And uh, that's when our third, the third co-founder, Steve, joined us. So Mm. that's kind of a little bit of like how I ended up doing Shepard and insurance. Um, if you'd asked me like two and a half years ago when we first started the company, I knew nothing about insurance. Um, <laughs> but now I, I guess it's it's a little like fun fact or a little yeah. party trick, if you will, when people are like, what do you do? I'm like construction, you know, because I found a company that does construction insurance. And that's when I get like the, uh, you know, the a wave of different <laughs> questions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Eyebrows, but also a lot of questions, uh, which is really fun. <laughs> I, uh, that is interesting. You know, I've got, I've got, so I, you know, I'm pretty much the same as you, kind of fell into insurance. I feel like that's a, a bit of a common theme from, from people, certainly from technology anyway. But, um, you know, the whole, we, we're, I'm definitely going to kind of get into that, the whole construction within insurance. I mean, it is such a, 
complex, antiquated beast of an industry that has construction to merge with insurance and uh, and it's just interesting that you have this hugely innovative business and shepherd out there in San Francisco looking to completely change the game on on how that and how that all operates. But you know, some touching on something that you know, thank you for the introduction. That was awesome. And 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 just touching on that kind of transition that you've made, you know, software engineer didn't originally start out in tech as you stay as you say at university. Like that whole transition from going from individual contributor, and I'm sure there was leadership aspects to the roles at Airbnb and previous, but you know, from you moving from, as I say, individual contributor to CTO and, and building your own company with your co founders, when you look back and would and, and learn, like what do you feel like the biggest shifts are when you make that transition from coding, being in the weeds, you know, working alongside the guys to co founder CTO? You know, does it feel much different or is it just a title to you? It doesn't really feel different. Uh, you mean like the title as a CTO? Does it feel different, or is it just the responsibilities and role? Yeah, yeah, just that whole transition from, as I say, software engineer yeah. from Airbnb to co-founder CTO. Like, is it was that? Did it feel like a natural yeah. thing in your career at that point? It, you know, it, I guess, um, you know, when I was at Airbnb, I wasn't managing a team, and I wasn't, you know, a director mm-hmm. VP level. So th- there's definitely that change, and I would even argue, you know, when I talk to friends that were in those leadership positions, um, starting a company is still a very different beast. Um, because, you know, you have your, especially in the early days, you know, your, your, your role is like the CTO, but also the co-founder. And those are very different roles. My co-founder roles are very, very different. What I'm responsible for, what I do. Um, and you know, my CTO roles in the early days, I was an IC, I was still building a lot of the product. Um, and now, you know, I'm managing a team and, um, you know, that, that is just a very different hat to wear. Um, I'm no longer kind of just purely interacting with code and, and, you know, the computer. I'm interacting with people and making sure people are happy, people are motivated. We're all, you know, doing the right things. Uh, we're pointing in the right direction. Um, you know, the CTO, the CTO's role is like very critical, you know, like right now, especially we're at a critical phase where, you know, I'm no longer doing as much IC work as I used to do, but also, um, you know, now starting to kind of figure out ways to scale myself and getting pulled a lot more into the co-founder responsibilities. Whereas before we're just, the only thing that matters is do people want what we're building? Um, And so, you know, all throughout that, I had to learn a lot. I'm growing, I'm making a lot of mistakes. Um, It's very humbling, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that I'm, you know, I'm growing into, I'm learning a lot. um, And it actually keeps me very motivated, very excited to, to, to come to work every day. Um, every day I'm like learning something new about myself or the team. Um, every day I'm having interactions like the one, you know, you and I are having that teach me something and help me grow. So that's been like a really fruitful experience so far that not to say I wouldn't get at Airbnb, but it's a very different experience. You know, my, my job there was to execute and execute mm-hmm. within my, you know, scope of work. Um, yeah. and that's not to say that I, I didn't like dabble and try to like take on more leadership and, and try to meet a lot of people and try to mentor people, et cetera. Like, I, I think those things were really good, um, learnings and experiences that I took that really kind of, you know, helped me start from a higher step as a, as a co-founder and CTO, but I'm still learning a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, um, I just always find it interesting. Some could never imagine, you know, a couple of years ago starting their own company and then you speak to some that, you know, they always kind of knew that, yeah, I was going to, I was always going to start something. It was just a case of, you know, when the timing was right. But it seems like that happened at quite an organic time in, in your career. But, um, you know, we've, usually we kind of give a brief description. We have kind of went off on a bit of a tangent there. But would you mind for the listeners just explaining a little bit about the Shepherd business and, and I guess what the overarching mission is for you guys? Yeah. So Shepard, uh, as it stands today, we do commercial construction insurance for middle market contractors. Um, and I say it's as it stands today because we have aspirations to do more than construction. Um, construction is our entry point. Um, mm. And it's 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 an area where we have a lot of expertise as a founding team, as well as like the early team members. Um, it's also the most high hazard of or one of the more high hazard industries. And so 
Um, if we could figure this out and do a really good job from both an insurance and technology perspective, we could start to extract a lot of those learnings into other industries. Um, we focus on middle market because they're fairly complicated to underwrite. Um, it's not two, two people in a truck looking for their you know, workers' compensation or their auto liability insurance, and they could just check out check out online. Um, a lot of our customers are doing, you know, from 20 to some, we have $10 billion in business. Um, and they're working across multiple states, across multiple geos, um, and they do different kinds of work. They may also subcontract a lot of work. Um, we take on a lot of different structures of insurance as well. And so it's fairly complicated where we needed to really bridge the gap um, and, you know, couple humans and and technology together um, to do something that is a lot more efficient, a lot more cost, uh, cost efficient as well, um, a lot faster um, than a lot of our competitors. Um, and the second thing, I, you know, to mention about Shepard that's really unique and different from from others, you know, construction insurance has existed for a long time. Um, you know, the thing that we, we do differently is twofold. Um, one, we reward contractors that use cons uh, construction tools uh, or technology tools on their site or back office by giving them premium credit. Um, so that's been a really interesting uh, angle that we've taken. We, we have a product or a program called Casualty Pro. Um, and so if you're a Procore, Open Space, Autodesk, or some SARA customer, um, you could take advantage of that. So that's one part. The other part that's really interesting is we're building a lot of software that we give to our customers or policyholders for free. Uh, and it's to help them with, you know, some of compliance work. It's to help them with some of their back back off back of office work. Um, it's to to help them, you know, reduce risk. Um, and so that's something that we give to our policyholders. We think, um, you know, we think technology and insurance could, you know, walk hand to hand uh, or hand in hand together. And so. Um, as part of that is like, how do we not, not just leverage our engineering and technology muscle to build our own products internally, uh, but also how can we extend that out and help our own customers to become a lot more efficient, a lot safer. Nice. Um, there's a guy that knows how to tell the story. He's been doing the pitches for a long time there. <laughs> Perfected <laughs> that Y Combinator. <laughs> yeah. Um. You know, how, how was that experience? You know, yeah, thank you for that. That's um, It paints the picture sure. beautifully about what you guys do. But, um, you know, that experience at, at Y Combinator, we don't have many businesses on the podcast that have been through it. Typically, you know, we we, we tend to get a lot from, I would maybe say, the UK version of Y Combinator, specifically within insurance, which is the, the Lloyd's Lab Accelerator. Very similar, 12-week, yeah. you know, fail fast very much advance the success rate of your business undoubtedly you know from kind of soup to nuts you just learn so much about your product but you know that is one of the best if not the best accelerators in the world like what was that experience like for you know for for you as a business but also for you personally you know and the products you were building how, how yeah. was it yeah so you you know the story of yc i would say uh this is a slight tangent but not uh, Trace is back to 2012. You know, I was in school at the time. I didn't know what I wanted to really do with studying psychology and economics, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then I was like, tech, startups, that sounds really cool. And um, I watched this uh, Vimeo video of one of the Airbnb co-founders, Joe Gebbia, talking about their Airbnb story and, um, you know, Y Combinator and just kind of all the progress. And this is 2012. You know, Airbnb is a very different company back then than it is and I remember watching that video and being like, holy shit, that is amazing. Startups are the coolest thing. Airbnb, never heard of it. That looks really cool. And Y Combinator, what is that? Um, yeah. And, uh, and you know, a couple of months later, I end up going to New York City with some friends. We stayed in Airbnb. My mom's like, holy, what are you doing? Uh, but that, you know, back then that was a crazy idea. But the story really starts from there is, you know, taking notice of YC uh and you know a company like airbnb and then discovering dropbox and you know many other like reddit and so on yeah. and so forth um fast forward always wanted to be a yc founder uh and then even when working at airbnb it was kind of cool to see like 2012 and seeing that video and like planting that seed inside my head and being like one day i'm going to start my own company one day i'm going to go through yc and one day maybe i'll be like airbnb and then working there and be like holy moly you know you could kind of um you know it's like reversing the tape and then playing it back and so on 
Um, and so yeah. I always knew I wanted to be a YC founder. It was just a matter of like what and when. Um, and we had an opportunity in, you know, we got accepted in December 2020 to participate in the program. So we were winter 21. Um, at the time, you know, it was it was online. It was remote. It was the midst of the pandemic. So my experience has shaped a little bit differently than others. But, um, you know, it is everything like I would have imagined and wanted for me personally and for the company. Um you know, we were surrounded by some of the smartest people, you know, the partners are all, uh, whether, you know, they're previous founders, um, or have been doing this for a very long time, their pattern recognition ability, their advice, um, their just sense of, you know, business and entrepreneurship is very strong. Um, mm. In some ways, it almost could feel like you have a personal trainer who every week is like, what have you accomplished? Um, and so that's really pushed us. Um and, you know, you, those those accomplishments compound. It's only three months program, but, you know, you take that and it really accelerates you. Hence why the name Accelerators. Yeah. Um, you know, the companies that we worked or, or were paired with were, you know, very, very incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, there's there's been many, many ones that have kind of come out and have had like really breakup success. Um, the thing that really stood out the most to us, though, is one of our partners was Tracy Young, who... Uh, started a company called Plan Grid, which was a YC company, had exited to Autodesk. Um, she exited around the same time as Building Connected, the company that Justin sold his company to, exited to Autodesk. And so it was kind of cool because they were both peers, different paths, but peers at Autodesk. And yeah. then, you know, a few short months later, she's a partner at YC and she is responsible for our group. <laughs> um, and having someone like that and her expertise on construction um, having worked as like a civil or structural engineer and then became a tech founder in the construction world and now YC partner and kind of being able to help us and look into our business and give us advice and push us forward has been really, really helpful. So uh, really attribute to like where we were, you know, or where we are today to our YC experience. And, you know, coming out of YC, we were able to raise a strong seed, uh, which we're still riding off of till today. Um, and um just taking a lot of the momentum. So really thankful for our, our experience at YC. I would say my final note is not a lot of intro text to your point. Uh, not a lot of intro text go through YC. Yeah. Um, and I think, and I think it could be just the nature of insure tech, um, you know, having to go and get a fronting carrier and reinsurance and the licensing and so on. Those are really hard to accomplish in three months. Um, mm. And, uh, and so, you know, you don't see a lot of insure techs. The most notable is new front. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and so they're, they're, you know, they're over a billion dollar mark, uh, over billion dollar valuation. They're not public yet. So they're not market cap, but, um, you know, they, they really kind of paved the road for other companies or other insure techs to go through YC, but yeah, they, uh, yeah. Yeah. Great experience. I mean, you guys are like, uh, must've felt a bit like an anomaly, you know, going into the, the YC and, and being an insure tech and like, yeah, I mean, it's it's so it's bizarre coincidence in the end, you know, when you say about that founder that, you know, sold the business to your co-founder, um, Tracy. And and then, you know, even way back at the beginning, you talk about almost affirmations, you know, looking at Airbnb, working with Airbnb, wanting to be a YC founder, like almost like a dream come true. So, yeah, that's awesome. It's a great story. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, a dream come true. And obviously, it's it's a very competitive program. So being mm -hmm. able to participate and get accepted was, you know, um, probably one of the, you know, highlights of like my career. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And, um, and you know, people and when you went into the that, I don't want to make it all about the YC, but it's more just coming now into the, the construction piece being people in construction, customers in construction, they're not, shall we say, the most technical of people. You know, it's not the most technical of, of industries. Maybe it's different in the US, but certainly in the UK, you know, some of these guys don't even have email addresses. <laughs> they just, they're so non-technical. But like, again, you kind of explained it with your co-founder coming from construction, but was that the the obvious move for you guys to to move into construction like why was that the space that you decided to be the entry point for shepherd why not another one yeah i i, I think it goes back to it goes back to our expertise um yeah and it goes back to just the rolodex that we had and, and mostly it was really justin and steve um yeah. you know i'd never worked in construction so it wasn't like i knew brokers or risk managers or, or so on um 
So it, it was mostly, it was a really strong beachfront for us. And, you know, I, I think I, I, I learned a big lesson in this. Um, and whenever I have friends that want to start companies, they're like, hey, what advice do you have? And not to deter them, I'm like, what are you what are you really good at? What do you know that like, or what access do you have that most people don't have? You should probably do that. Um, and like, obviously, I'm not the perfect example because I didn't come from insurance or construction, but my co-founders did. Um, and so that was, that gave us a head start. Um, as opposed to, you know, an industry or, um, you know, a sector that we had no familiar, like we, we were just not familiar with. Um, it would have been very difficult for us to start and we wouldn't know, you know, how to get help, how to like yeah. tap people in and so on. So, um, I, you know, I attribute a lot of our progress so far, uh, just really kind of on the backs of, of you know, Justin and Steve's network um, and their experience and so on. So that's that's been like incredibly helpful. So that's why we chose construction. But, I, you know, I think even if we were to go back and we knew about no industry, um, you know, trust and kind of confidence and like, can we do it in construction being so high hazard? That aside, I still think we would do construction again just because um, it's everywhere. You know, it's it's like it's it's everywhere. It touches all of our lives. It's very high hazard. Um you know, it's 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 an area that we can have a lot of impact on, but it's also just a really good beachfront as well to look into other industries. But we're really heavily focused. We want to dig in. We're going to continue to dig in on construction. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, we would choose construction again for sure. Mm. Because <clears throat> yeah, as you say, it's high, it's high hazard, it's high risk. There's so much to underwrite the data. Because now we have, you know, companies like Procore, who I think you work with, you know, these SaaS platforms that are now gathering so much data for, for many, many years. But, you know, as an industry, again, going back to it, like you you, you and I touched on how when you look back on it, you realize you, didn't, you underestimated how difficult it actually would be to innovate. It's like, is that because of, as a slow moving industry, you know, when I take a UK example, you know, Aviva, um, they have over a thousand systems um, currently, you know, so to add in for a broker to add in another system or, you know, into that, is it, do you feel like, I just kind of get the sense in construction that a lot of it is very slow moving. It's, there's a lot of guys, you know, customers that aren't tech savvy and they just want to just hand their insurance over to the broker. You know, just phone their guy and say, just just go and sort that, go and fix that for me. Like, has that been the the challenge to change the mindset? Do you think, or is it is it more than that to you? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's a spectrum for sure, and because of the just, you know, I, there's two things that I should have mentioned actually to the last question as well is like mm -hmm. one, construction companies are buying multiple lines of coverage, which is very unique. Um, you know, if we yeah. were doing some other industry, um. You know, let's. I'm making this up. Like, if we were gonna do like um, vintage vehicles, you know, we're gonna do insurance in that like that specialty, or we're gonna do boat insurance. You know, like personal air. You know, uh, watercrafts. Like, that's very specific. Whereas construction, you know, they're typically buying general liability, auto, workers comp, builders risk, professional yeah. pollution. Like, they're buying so they're buying cyber. Um, so they're buying multiple lines. Um, so just more at shots for us. Um. And then I think the second thing to, to kind of answer your second question is we work with, you know, a small, you know, road and bridge, you know, builder contractor to mm -hmm. like ones that are, you know, I don't want to say even multi-state, but they could be like doing work in Canada and Mexico as well. Um, those are very different operations. Um, you know, yeah, the, the like the street and road work might be, you know, doing a lot more public work and just a lot more focus on doing a really good job. Um, and like, you know, in a, in a certain amount of time or deadlines, whereas, you know, the larger ones, maybe they're focusing a lot more on technology and back of office. And, you know, they actually have a very large team and staff uh, back of office. And, you know, they are using Microsoft Teams. They are using, you know, the latest tools. They do understand um, the value of technology. Um, they do understand the value of using something like Procore to make them more efficient because their margins are so, you know, and so they just can't afford to have delays. They need, you know, high level of coordination. So you, you will get like all the whole spectrum in construction. Um, so mm. I, I wouldn't say like the industry, you know, the industry as a whole does lag a little bit from other industries. That's for sure when it comes mm. to technology adoption. But there's a lot of 
companies that are technology first and they're really kind of moving, you know, or pulling the industry forward. And a great example of that is like Suffolk. Suffolk is like, you know, they don't just have like a venture arm. They don't just build their own internal tools. Like they do a lot of different things. They have a true IT and engineering, you know, technology engineering team. So they're, they're like a great example of like a very technology forward builder that, you know, everybody uses them as an example and wants to do what they do. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, I think the US market and the UK market within there is, I think, very different, but it's just a really, really interesting insight. And, you know, from 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 my from my understanding from what you're saying, it's very much you guys have spotted clearly a, a massive opportunity. You know, I saw your uh, LinkedIn post the other day, you know, I was trying to just get up there, but it seemed like in terms of goals, you know, launched your launched across 15 states, um, uh, announced another partnership. Forgive me, I can't remember the partnership name. Sorry. And um, yeah. I'm sure you can probably fill in. But um, but just way ahead of your goals, I mean, what is the, why do you think, where have the gaps been in this in this service offering that you guys can now fill in? And, and why do you think there has been that gap that you have been able to capitalize so much on? Yeah, I think it's too parts um you know for us we we almost see two like customers or users of ours you know we have the brokers that are our partners um and then we have the insurance um on the on the broker side um there's been just a lot of frustration around um speed um you know sometimes uh larger insurers will take multiple days to get, get a quote or to get back to them or to give them appetite or whatever it is uh what you know, what we came to market immediately is we promise them a 24 hour SLA. And yeah. more often than not, we do it in less than, than, uh, than 12 hours. Um, we give them an indication right away, whether this is within appetite, whether we'll look at this, sometimes we even get a quote out within 24 hours. And that's just unseen or unheard of in the construction world. It's not because insurers are lazy. Uh, it's, it's just a very, very difficult uh, line of business to underwrite. Um, and we've just built a lot of tech to streamline a lot of that, automate a lot of the process. And so therefore, um, you know, our underwriters are spending a lot more time on the, you know, technical work uh, of underwriting and less the administrative. Um, and so like, we just kind of position our technology and our organization to be really fast, really efficient, and just spend more time with the brokers, make sure their needs are met, make sure we have like high level of communication between us and them. And so that's like really helped us address a lot of the challenges the brokers had. Um, and as a result, brokers love working with us. Um, they continue to send us more business and, you know, the flywheel continues to spin faster, which is great. Um, we, we often see like, for example, one broker, you know, from an office that we've never, you know, seen before would send us something, have a really great experience, share it with the rest of their office. And then we start to see like a flow of submissions from that office. So that, that kind of like starts to clue us into, you know, we're doing something really interesting and unique for the brokers, but they're not the only decision makers. Uh, it's really the insurance. And what we've done is, you know, we've really done two things. Uh, one is we're rewarding technology usage. We are technology first insurer. And so if you are using technology such as Procore Open Space, we will give you insurance credits. And that's something that you don't see um, often or at, at most other insurance companies. Yeah. And the second thing yeah. is like the usage of software and giving software for free. Um, I think, you know, it's what's really cool is like we look at, you know, we look at, let's say, Ramp, which is... Um, you know, they're they're uh, they're a business credit card and bank account for startups, uh, or we look at Rippling, or even to some extent we look at Lemonade, and we take a lot of inspiration from them. Um, yeah. And Lemonade is like really good at you know using data, but also giving you all these free things or offers if you use Lemonade. Um, for example, their EV offering, their electric vehicle offering, they like do all these things for you, which which are like added benefits. Um, you know, when you look at Ramp, you just get a business credit card and account, but you get like expense management software for free and you get this and that for free. Um, and so we're taking a lot of inspiration from these other companies and applying those learnings to us. Mm. Yeah, I think it's um, it's so interesting from the, the positioning that you've came in at. You know, we talk about waves of, of innovation within insurance, you know, wave one very much being the, the challengers, the disruptors and wave two being the kind of enablers and then that wave three is where you guys just fit perfectly in which is that ecosystem partner you know you're talking about giving credits out for people that are partnering is or, or 
coming across as as tech first companies within insurance and and you know you've built this this platform that effectively you know you're an MGA that with the capacity to underwrite risk you know provide a, a broking SaaS tool which the inaugural product and you give that out for free <laughs> um, you know that whole journey that you're on is really that major shift that we're seeing within that mega trend if you like being a, a true ecosystem partner within within insurance and insure tech. Yeah, yeah, we, you know, we, we, you know, we understand financial services could, you know, more or less look the same. Um, you know, if you look at a credit card, you know, what's one yeah. credit card versus the other one? Yeah. Same, you know, they're giving you money, they're charging you the same cost for the money. Um, but, you know, one maybe gives you, you know, the specific airlines points or lounge or, you know, 2% back on dinner or whatever, like, you know, restaurants or whatever it is. That's why, you know, consumers end up choosing one over the uh, over the other. So, you know, there, there's some learnings from other financial products, um, you know, not saying credit cards are like our primary example, <clears throat> but, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to borrow from from other industries um, or I should say other sectors and within finance um, and start to bring some of that thinking into what we do, um, especially because, you know, we we are startup, we are technology first, we have a fantastic engineering product and design team. Um, so we're able to take on some of these challenges. Um and uh, and really, you know, at, at the end of the day, like we're we're really trying to punch above our weight, which is we're not just providing insurance. We're providing a lot more than that. I think another one that I should mention as well is like Coalition and At Bay. They've really, yeah. you know, created, you know, trailblazed that, which is, you know, Coalition is, you know, we're going to give you software that's going to do all this monitoring for you. And we're going to couple that with insurance. Mm. So a lot of learnings there within InsureTech, within, you know, financial products um, that, um, you know, we're borrowing and bringing it to an industry that hasn't really seen any of these things. Um, you know, you're not really getting rewarded for using more technology. You're not getting rewarded for doing a you know better job or, you know, improving your safety. As a matter of fact, you know, we're seeing rates go up all across the board, whether you're good or not. So, um, you know, we're, we're just bringing something very different to the industry. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. We had that be on, well, Alex um, on the original series. I thought that was a uh... A really great episode and and yeah you know pioneers as you say like you know what's next for for you guys you know you seem very much ahead of the game ahead of the targets like what's what's next in the next 12 months is it uh, casualty lines across all 54 states is that is that right is that the right number <laughs> uh 50 50 states 50 sorry uh, wouldn't be the wouldn't be the first time I said something. By the way, I'm podcast. Canadian, so I, I I'm pretty sure it's fifty. I'm Canadian. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's fifty. <laughs> well, anyway, is it is it domination across the the US? Do you think? Do you see a time that comes because it's such a complex thing, state to state, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, over the next twelve months, um, I I really see you know three maybe four things. One is yes, expand the number of states coverage for our primary casualty lines, uh, which we just announced two weeks ago. Um, so, uh, you know, we want to continue to expand that coverage. It's really important for us, really important for our customers. We have customers that do business in multiple states. So we have to we have to try to cover that. Um, so that's number one. The second thing is we want to, you know, go vertical within construction. So offer more uh, insurance products. So we're looking at builder's risk uh, as an example. We're looking at workers' comp. We're looking at professional liability. So th- those are those are things that we want to double down on construction um, and continue to to provide more products there. Um, third, we want to continue to to you know improve and grow our software you know offering. Um, so right now we have a compliance tool. Um, you know we want to there we have a diff- different number of ideas that we think we could go next on, um, and so um, we're going to continue to invest in that offering. And then lastly, really, you know, at the end of the 12 months is really starting to shape ourselves for going horizontal. So, you know, what's the next industry outside of construction that we're going to start looking into? Um, And so we have some ideas there. For example, real estate, you know, we ensure as the the building is being built, uh, totally makes sense to ensure it while it's standing. Um, And typically it's, it's, it's the same broker or oftentimes the same broker that handles the two. Um, And so, you know, that, that's like an area that we'll be looking at next, but um, yeah, we have a very exciting next twelve months for sure. Yeah, no, it sounds it. I mean, and it's such a mixed bunch of expertise. You know, your leadership team is, yeah, a combination of insurance, construction, tech. It's all split between 
uh, engineering product design and underwriting actuarial claims, like a real definition of an insure tech, I think. You know, how how do you how do you describe that culture at how do you how do you kind of describe your culture at Shepherd? Is it is it something that because in those twelve months to eighteen months, I'm I'm assuming more scale, more hiring, more launch of as you say, different products and you'll be leading that. Is that you know yeah. how important is that culture to achieve that? Uh you know, I, I guess you know all the prog- all the progress and everything that we've achieved so far is is like really awesome and like really exciting. But the thing that I'm most proud of, actually, beyond all of that, is the team that we built. Yeah. Um, you know, the team is so diverse. The team comes from so many different backgrounds. Um, the the amount of energy, the hustle, um, the empathy that everybody brings to work every day. Um, you know, I, I obviously I'm the co-founder of the company, so it's really easy for me to say this is the best team I've ever worked on. But reality is, is actually this is the best team I've ever worked on. Um, and I'm sure I've, you know, we'll have some friends listening to this episode later on and that I worked with. But, um, you know, love working with you. But this is like really the, the <laughs> I would say the best team I've ever worked on. Um, you know, I, I, we have this one of our core values that we we talk a lot about is crossing the aisle. Um, yeah. And uh and we actually borrowed this from Gordon at Newfront. Uh, Gordon is the co-founder and CTO of Newfront, and um, yeah. I'm pretty sure they have the same value, um, if not some one similar. So if you look at, you know, if you look at our company, for example, in a way, we could end up being like a dumbbell. You know, you have the insurance folks, and you have the, you know, product and engineering folk, folks, and there's just that metal in between that kind of connects the two. And like, that's not really what we want because they're very, very different. So we want to kind of cross the aisle and actually bring the two pieces together. Um, especially because a lot of insurance folks have never worked in tech. Um, and a lot of the, you know, tech folks have never worked in insurance. And so how do we build a culture of openness, of empathy, of just being yeah. able to raise your hand and ask the most, you know, very simplest question, um, uh, ask, you know, being having access to anybody at the company and being able to, you know, spend time with them and ask them and, and just being able to look over their shoulder and understand what their day in life looks like. Uh, this is such an important culture value to us that we hope continues to be for the eternity of this company. Um, you know, it's, it, it is what makes us special, you know, the cohesion between the insurance folks, um, you know, being able to kind of like roll their chair over and be like, Hey, I have a question for you about the platform or about this or about that, or wouldn't it be nice to have this? And like the engineering or product folks are like, yeah, I love that idea. It's great. Let me like get excited and implement it right away and vice mm-hmm. versa, you know, coming over and being like, I have a question for you. I don't really understand what like LCM stands for or like what does loss cost me or whatever it is. And having, you know, the access and, and, um, and, and, you know, the, the knowledge like right there from the insurance folks, um, yeah, is really valuable. And I think that's like what makes Shepard really special. And, um, you know, we, we, again, we borrow from other organizations, whether in SureTech or FinTech that, um, you know, have done a really good job of creating that culture. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, we do construction and insurance, but our biggest product that I'm most proud of is, is the people in the team. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's, it's amazing to kind of hear that you speak with such passion about that. I mean, the, for me, it's like I asked that question in a different way, I guess, not intentionally, like that mixture of insurance pre- professionals, the the jargon, you know, as you say, just to ask about, you know, lost cost model, what does this mean? To create that culture truly, though, where people can feel comfortable to ask those things and and just allow everyone to just be in that continuous learning state, that can come up with new ideas, can execute, bring outside perspectives, like, what do you think the secret or not the secret? What do you think the, you know, yeah. What do you think the kind of secret sauce is that you've, that you've created that, along with your co-founders, you know, what's that big thing that you guys have been able, had to do to, to really create that? Is it to have everyone in the office three, four days a week? Is it, is it just to just simply create that psychological safety where people can just speak up and ask these questions? Like what is it for you? What's the big thing that you need to get right to enable that? Yeah, I, I, you know, obviously, I, <laughs> I don't think we could take too much credit. We just got very lucky with, you know, an, a, just incredible group of people that are excited about the mission, excited about what we're working on, and come to work every day like excited and happy and motivated. Um, 
so you know don't want to take credit from it's it's really all the people um but i do think there's a couple of things that you know we uh, made a decision on that may have assisted um so for example we were you know we 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 had an in-person or still have an in-person culture early on um we got like our first office in 2021 and people thought we were uh crazy at the time um but i do think you know as a startup especially with one that it's just very different worlds you know if, if we were doing SaaS, or if we were doing consumer or if we we're doing something to do with like data pipelines or something like that it would have been maybe different um having everybody you know it would have been okay to be remote but just like the ability to transfer knowledge um and being able to ask questions and you know understanding that like both sides um may speak different languages but how do we kind of like you know bring everybody to the table um and just like a very empathetic and just humbling and you know curious way um I think it's really helped us a lot. It's really helped with a lot of the progress that we've had so far. It's really helped create the strong cohesion between the teams and members. Um, you know, we like order lunch every day and eat together. We do a bunch of activities outside of work together. We work out together, uh, not every day, but like just in general, like there's a lot of things outside of work that we do as a team um, that I, I think really helped create this like strong cohesion. Um, and if I was to do it all over again, I would do, make the same decision um, because I, I think this was the right decision for the team. So I, I don't have secret sauce. I wish I had like something to, to say <laughs> that like, you know, we, uh, we, 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 but we definitely got lucky with, uh, with that. And, and, and I do think like, you know, just looking at the founding team, like Justin is in a way that metal between the two dumbbells, like I'm on one side, Steve on the other side, like never worked in insurance. He's never worked in, in tech, but like he's the domain expert, you know, Steve, when he was at Chubb, led a book of two hundred million dollars plus of construction. Um, so, like, he is that domain expert. Um, and you know, I wasn't as impressive as him, but I was a software engineer at Airbnb. And you know, Justin is like the you know the the bridge in between. Um, and just like being very kind of empathetic and understanding, and just leading with curiosity within us has kind of started to extend outside. But again, don't want to take credit for for us. I think it's really the team has has been incredible. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, that's a, I think that's a fitting point to end the podcast on, you know, a really great culture piece. Um, Mo, thanks for your time. I know you're a busy man, so I really appreciate you giving us the time to come on. And um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Um, You know, hope, uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun and uh, looking forward to hearing it, looking forward to the feedback and, and, and everything <laughs> from there. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolute pleasure.